Okay, so we should be recording. I know I'm starting one minute early, but that's okay. If I pause in the middle of this, it's just because I'm letting other students, I'm admitting them from the waiting room. So where we left off, um, we talked about muscle metabolism yesterday, which just means how a muscle cell, uh, in what order the muscle cell uses and generates ATP, should it need to sustain any sort of contraction after a few seconds. So first and foremost from that, I'm gonna do a quick review on, on what um, I think is most important. There are, really there are four sources that a muscle uses ATP. First, it's stored ATP that it has, but you know that's only a few seconds. That just gets things going. Then direct phosphorylation, a muscle uses that. <clears throat> That's when creatine phosphate donates its phosphate via that enzyme, creatine kinase, in order to directly phosphorylate the ADP, adenosine diphosphate. But that again only lasts for a handful of seconds. And then a muscle goes to anaerobic glycolysis, um, in which it uses a fuel source within the body. The, the fuel source that's most quickly used and readily available is a glucose molecule, a simple sugar. When that's broken down in the absence of oxygen, um, the muscle cell harvests two ATP from that glucose molecule. It also produces pyruvate, which converts to lactic acid when there is no oxygen. That lactic acid is what gives us our muscles that burning feeling, um, but when either oxygen is introduced or when we stop that activity, that lactic acid is quickly broken down by the liver so we don't feel that burn anymore. And finally, the fourth source is cellular respiration, which is an aerobic pathway. It requires oxygen, um, the oxygen, and then technically the pyruvate, which is a, a byproduct of, which is a product of glycolysis. So the pyruvate and the oxygen head to the mitochondria in the muscle cell, and that's where cellular respiration occurs. That citric acid, acid cycle that you learn in bio one, coupled with the electron transport chain, and those things produce, those two things, so we've got a glucose molecule, an energy source, and oxygen together, they produce from one glucose molecule 32 ATP, so it's super efficient, produces a lot of energy for the muscle, but it's slow, takes a long time. So that was a quick review. Now I'm gonna go on to um, call up my new whiteboard here. So I'm gonna go on to the force of a muscle contraction. So let me write that real quickly. I'm just writing force of contraction. That means how much force a muscle can produce. <clears throat> and it, this is affected by four factors. So I always tell students when I teach this class in person, um, I lift up a pencil off of my desk and I say, we need a lot less force of contraction to do this activity and then I walk over and I either pick up a chair or something heavy in the room and I say, we need a lot more force to, to perform this activity. How do our muscles vary that type of contraction? How do they, and this is what affects the differences in force of contraction. I just list them as one, two, three, four. First, the number of fibers stimulated, <clears throat> sure Tara, I'll be with you in a sec. So the number of fibers stimulated, let me do that. So, um, all right, Tara, you've been, uh, you've been clicked. So we're talking about varying the force of, so in a muscle, you know that it has hundreds of fibers within one muscle, sometimes possibly even a thousand fibers. So, if we stimulate fewer fibers, we get less force. If we stimulate more fibers within that muscle, we, we can generate a greater force. That's all number one means. That's pretty easy to sort out. Also, the size 
of fiber stimulated. So a muscle is made up of hundreds to thousands of fibers. There are different sizes of muscle fibers within an individual muscle. Typically, here's what happens. The smaller, less force producing fibers, so you can just think of them as weaker, the smaller, weaker fibers typically get stimulated in a muscle first by neurons. And then as additional force is needed, necessary to produce a stronger contraction, bigger, stronger fibers that produce more force, they get stimulated later. And so the size of the fibers that get stimulated also dictates the generation of force produced. Three is the frequency of stimulation. We haven't talked about this much yet because we haven't done the nervous system yet. But if I have a muscle here and I have a nerve stimulating fibers, in that muscle, if I send an impulse, a nerve impulse to these fibers, and I do that, I send an impulse once, wait a few seconds, send another one, wait a few seconds, send another impulse, wait a few seconds, that's not gonna produce nearly as much force as if I send an impulse and then I speed up the frequency of stimulation faster and faster, so impulse, and impulse, 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 impulse. If we increase the frequency of stimulation, that will increase the force of contraction. And finally, number four, this one is a little bit harder for most students to wrap their head around, but I'll try my best to explain it. It's the, it's the degree of muscle stretch. So let me explain that one. All muscles <clears throat> prior to contraction, so let me write that in parentheses, that'll help you remember. All muscles prior to contraction have an ideal length at which they can produce the greatest amount of force during contraction. If you've ever exercised, worked out, you, you intuitively sort of know this. <clears throat> but if a muscle before it contracts is too stretched out and then the muscle is stimulated to contract, or if it's already mostly contracted and then stimulated to contract, it won't produce as great a force as if it was an ideal length. Um, if you've ever tried to do a pull-up, even if you haven't, you can imagine this. If your arms are completely stretched out, super straight, you're hanging from a bar, and your arms are, you're almost like your elbows are locked, it's hard to generate a lot of force in that muscle. Likewise, if you've already completed most of that pull-up, <clears throat> if your ar arms are already mostly bent at the elbow, and then you start a contraction, that force won't be as great as if there was an ideal preset amount of muscle stretch prior to contraction. So these four factors influence greatly the amount of force that a muscle can produce once it contracts. Along those same lines, <clears throat> within this conversation, so this is a different topic, but it's similarly related to that force of contraction business, is a topic in your chapter called a graded muscle response. What that means is just variable contraction. So this is a similar topic. Back to the, if I wanna lift a pencil off the table, I need to produce a lot less force during contraction than if I want to lift something really heavy, like a 30 pound weight. And how our muscles vary that response, that force of contraction, we call a graded muscle response. That just means variable. So a muscle can be graded or varied 
the, the force of contraction in one of two ways. And that is either by change in stimulus frequency. And we already talked about that one. <clears throat> this is called, and I do want you to remember this term, whenever we change a frequency of something, temporal, the word temporal means time. So what we're doing is we're changing the rate of stimulus firing from the neuron. So this is called temporal summation. Now what I described to you on the previous whiteboard, I'm gonna show you on a graph. <clears throat> I'm gonna draw this graph. <clears throat> and this is just a function of time down here on the X axis. And this is the force generated of contraction. I just need to pause and let another student in. So I know no students really typically like to look at graphs of, of things, but this will help explain <clears throat> what the, the point of this temporal summation means. If I stimulate a muscle and I st with a neuron, and I stimulate it, I mean, you, I'm just going to say, bang, I stimulated the muscle, it produces a force, and then I don't stimulate it again, that force goes down. And then bang, I stimulate it with the neuron, it produces force, and then the muscle relaxes. If I bang, stimulate that neuron, and then bang, stim it again, stimulate it again more quickly, and then more quickly, and more quickly, and more quickly, meaning I, I stimulate it more frequently, over the course of time, it increases the force that that muscle cell produces. So they be, the reason we use the word summation is the forces become additive if I stimulate it more frequently from the neuron. So stimulate and then let it relax. Wait, stimulate it again, let it relax, wait, but if I stimulate and don't let it relax all the way, stimulate again, stimulate, 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 the force increases. That's called temporal summation. <clears throat> Eventually, those forces, we, won't e we wouldn't even see these little hills and valleys. The force of the muscle contraction would come up and be a smooth line until we get muscle fatigue, and then it would finally drop off. The whole point is if we increase the frequency of stimulation, we get a summation over time of the force produced. The second type of variable contraction or factor is if we change the actual stimulus strength. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna write a number two on my next whiteboard. Still talking about a graded muscle response. And I'm gonna write a change in stimulus strength. So we're not necessarily stimulating the muscle with a nerve cell more frequently. We're stimulating it harder with a stronger stimulation. <clears throat> and how we do this, it's not called temporal summation. It's called multiple motor unit summation. So we get, we summate the force of contraction by basically adding more neurons to the muscle. What I mean by that is <clears throat> small fibers are typically recruited first by the most sensitive neurons. So I'm gonna draw a muscle here. These are individual muscle fiber cells. I'm not gonna draw the bundles and the fascicles and all of that stuff. There's an individual muscle. <clears throat> Small fibers within this muscle are typically stimulated first. So I'm just gonna pick some and call those the small fibers. So if I wanna pick up a pencil or a sheet of paper, all that's necessary for that muscle, the force that needs to be produced to lift that sheet of paper is a stimulation from this one 
neuron that stimulates a few of the weak fibers in that muscle, and I can lift that sheet of paper. The medium fibers then get stimulated. I'm going to draw this a thicker black. The medium fibers get stimulated next in this muscle. Should I want to pick up a textbook? Okay, and so if this neuron gets fired and this neuron gets fired, this muscle can produce more force to lift something that's heavier. Finally, the largest, more, the, the largest fibers for maximum force contraction get recruited last in this muscle. You've experienced this if, for example, you've gone to lift up something that you don't know how heavy it is. You walk over, say, and you try to pick up a box. You're not sure if it's empty if there's it, or if there's something heavy in it. So you bend over and you start to lift gently or cautiously, that's firing of, the, of this nerve. In my example, that would be firing of the first nerve that only stimulates your weakest muscle fibers. And then you, you quickly, your nervous system responds in microseconds, in milliseconds. And so quickly you figure out, ah, there's something heavier in here, I need more force. And your nervous system then feeds back and fires stronger fibers within those muscles and finally if something's really heavy so what we're doing is we're adding motor units of stimulation so i'm going to put neurons in parentheses here so just to reiterate quickly before i move on temporal summation refers to firing neurons at a faster rate Multiple motor unit summation means firing more neurons that stimulate stronger fibers. That change, both of those factors change the, for, the amount of force that a muscle can produce. All right. Some other, now we're on to a different topic. This doesn't have anything to do with um, graded muscle response. I just want to go over terms that you need to know to do well on the next quiz. This term, hypertrophy, this refers to enlargement, specifically of a skeletal muscle. From stimulation. I'm just going to say <clears throat> when you um, enlarge a muscle from resistance training. We all know that people who, for example, work out with weights, that's resistance training, their muscles enlarge. When a muscle enlarges due to some sort of resist, multiple resistance, that's called hypertrophy. The opposite of that is atrophy. <clears throat> A-T-R-O-P-H-Y. Atrophy is specifically a decrease in muscle size from lack of stimulation. So easiest example is you go to the gym, you work out for six months really hard with weights, your muscles get bigger. If you decide, I don't want to do that anymore for whatever reason, <clears throat> you stop performing those exercises, your muscles decrease in size. <clears throat> now, atrophy is temporary atrophy is reversible. So an extreme example of atrophy is if, if one is bedridden, a sick person or somebody with a disease is bedridden, um, temporary atrophy, that just means over the course of weeks and months, that's reversible. But long-term atrophy is not. Over the course of months to years, that's irreversible and muscle tissue decays and dies. 
the fibers actually die over long-term lack of use. All right, I'm gonna draw a line here because I need to cover two, <clears throat> basically two more major topics. The next one is muscle fiber types. This is still within skeletal muscle. We have basically three types of muscle fibers. And they are characterized based on the two factors. What that means is we put these three types into their, into their separate categories based on these two things. And those two factors of characterizing muscle fiber types are first, the speed of contraction, how fast a muscle can perform a contraction. <clears throat> so we call them either slow fibers or fast fibers. The difference, I'm gonna put a star next to this, the difference in speed of contra in contraction <clears throat> lies within how fast myosin enzymes, which are called ATP aces, split that ATP molecule on the myosin head <clears throat> and the activity in their motor neurons. So the speed of how fast a muscle is, <clears throat> I'm going to say dependent on myosin ATP aces those are enzymes that split that, that terminal phosphate, ATP, on the myosin head. So that depends, that dictates speed of contraction of a muscle. And the other thing is the activity of their motor neurons, how fast the nerves are. So fast muscles have really fast neurons firing on them, and they also have enzymes, ATP aces, that split their ATP molecule very quickly. And activity of, I'm gonna say motor neurons. So that's speed of contraction. I need a new whiteboard. Number two is pathways for forming ATP, which you know now, all of the pathways for forming ATP. <clears throat> what this means is that fibers that rely on oxygen, that aerobic pathway, cellular respiration, <clears throat> are called oxidative fibers. So we have oxidative fibers and fibers, muscle fiber types that don't rely on oxygen are called glycolytic. And next to these, I'm gonna put aerobic and anaerobic. Okay. Now we're gonna actually do the three categories of muscle fiber types. So these are the three types. Number one, we have slow, all of us have these three types by the way, slow oxidative fibers. All of us have these three types of fibers within our muscles, skeletal muscles in our body, but we all have a different combination of these fiber, fibers based on our genetics. So we all have these three types, <clears throat> but the makeup of how many of each type depends on our, our genes, our genetics. So these slow oxidative fibers, first of all, they are small in diameter. So they're not very thick. Just gonna give you their characteristics. They are best suited for endurance exercises. So things like a long 
um, casual swim or a really long endurance jog, something like that. We use these fibers for those activities. <clears throat> these fibers contain many, many mitochondria. <clears throat> so that makes sense, obviously, right? <clears throat> If these fibers use a lot of oxygen, then it makes sense that they have many mitochondria within them because that's where oxygen gets used in the cell. <clears throat> More characteristics of these, they are highly, I'm just gonna put high vascularization. <clears throat> Sorry, it's allergies with this rain coming down vascularization. I was also up really late last night. So there's a rich blood supply coming to these slow oxidative fibers. That also makes sense because that's the source of oxygen. Where a muscle gets its oxygen is from the blood supply and they're using oxygen. Finally, I'm going to say they have a high amount and content of myoglobin, which also makes sense. That's the protein molecule pigment that binds oxygen and turns bright red. I'm just gonna put red when binds O2. So they're very red in color. These muscle fiber types are red in color because they have a lot of oxygen that's bound to that myoglobin. All right, that's the first type, slow oxidative fibers. The second major type are opposite, so they would be fast glycolytic fibers. And if you've been reading your textbook or coming to these lectures or watching my lectures in recording, this should make sense to you now. What the word glycolytic means should at least make sense to you. These tend to be large in diameter, so they're big, Characteristics are almost the, the complete opposite. <clears throat> These tend to have large glycogen stores within them, meaning they have sugar glucose molecules stored within them because they're gonna need that for a burst of activity, of energy. And I'm gonna put four anaerobic production of ATP. <clears throat> they are all, these also are powerful a low content of mitochondria these fibers fatigue quickly so just think of them as for strength, but they don't la the, the contraction ability doesn't last long, but it's powerful. So they fatigue very quickly. <clears throat> they also tend to be white. I'm putting that in quotes because they're not perfectly white, but they tend to be white in color when we look at them compared to this type. So these tend to be red. These tend to be more whitish looking because they have a low myoglobin content. The reason is because they're not using oxygen, so that makes sense. They don't have that molecule that binds and stores oxygen. <clears throat> All right, the third and final type of muscle fiber in the human body is sort of a mixture between number one and two. And number three are called fast <clears throat> oxidative fibers. Oops, starting to write fast again. Facts, fast oxidative fibers. So these are a combination of number one and two. Sometimes they are referred to as intermediate fibers. 
So they have characteristics of both one and two. <clears throat> this word tells us that they are oxygen dependent. So they do use oxygen, like the slow oxidative ones. <clears throat> so they're oxygen dependent. They have a rich blood supply. bringing that oxygen in, but they don't have much myoglobin. So they can't store that oxygen. They get it from the rich blood supply, but it's sort of a temporary supply. They can't store a lot of that oxygen. <clears throat> they contract quickly which is why they're called fast. <clears throat> but they're more resistant to fatigue than a fast glycolytic fiber. So I'm going to put that in parentheses, more resistant to fatigue <clears throat> than the fast glycolytic ones. These fibers in particular can be converted to number one type, slow oxidative fibers, or number two type, fast glycolytic fibers, depending on our activity. So our bodies do have the ability to convert a muscle type for, from one type to another. And it's, it's mostly these, these intermediate fibers. For example, I'm born, you and I are both, both just born with the combination of these three fibers that we have in our bodies. But let's just say I want to become a bodybuilder, a weightlifter slash bodybuilder. I perform a lot of resistance training, exercising for months and months and months. I can actually convert, or let's just say I want to become a sprinter, an Olympic sprinter. I can convert my number three intermediate fibers, my fast oxidative fibers. I can recruit them to become fast glycolytic fibers. Now, let's say I do that for a year and I get bored of that and I want to become a marathon runner. After I stop being training to be a sprinter, my intermediate fibers that were converted to fast glycolytic fibers, they go back to becoming this intermediate fiber type. And then I start training for a marathon. <clears throat> I do that for months or a couple years. My fast, my intermediate fibers, these fast oxidative fibers can be converted then to become slow oxidative fibers to assist my activity in being a marathon runner. So that's what we mean when we say, or you read, certain fiber types can be converted or recruited to act like other fiber types. That's, that's the gist of it. So a muscle, an entire muscle in the human body is typically made up of a mixture of fiber types. An individual muscle, say for example, your, your biceps muscle or and take any skeletal muscle in the human body, within that muscle has a variation of fiber types. <clears throat> Now, depending on where the muscle is located and what it's typically used for, it will have a different combination of those three fiber types, depending on other muscles in the human body. It sort of depends on what that, act, that muscle's used for activity-wise. All right, last topic of the day. I'm trying to get through this kind of quickly because it's Friday. <clears throat> I do want to highlight the last unit in your book is about smooth muscle. Up until this point, almost everything that we've talked about and that you've read has been referring to skeletal muscle, the muscles that you and I think of when we hear the word muscle that are attached to our bones. The last unit, which is quite short in your book, refers to smooth muscle. I'm not gonna um, write out all the characteristics of it. You know that they have one nucleus per cell, no striations. The locations are that they are found in the walls of our digestive organs, our visceral organs, and the walls of our vessels. 
They are involuntarily controlled. That means they're controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So we don't have conscious control over their, their contractions. <clears throat> I am gonna give you some characteristics now that both separate smooth muscle characteristically from skeletal muscle. And then I'm also gonna talk about some similarities to skeletal muscle. So structurally smooth muscle has only, that's sorry, that was not written well, has only endomycium as its connective tissue covering. So the muscles themselves are not arranged like a skeletal muscle. There's no perimycium forming fascicles. There's no epimycium wrapping around the whole, the entire muscle forming it, sort of this rough, coarse tendon sheath. It only has a thin, delicate connective tissue. So this, the muscles, the actual smooth muscles are arranged in sort of delicate sheets. not these sort of three-dimensional volumetric muscles. They're flat sheets that are more delicately arranged. <clears throat> There's typically two layers to these muscles. Not always, but more than not. So I'm gonna write typically these muscles have two layers to them. A longitudinal layer and a transverse or circular layer. <clears throat> that just means the direction of the fibers. So within say the lining of this vessel, or if it was the esophagus, here's a tube, lining this organ is a sheet of smooth muscle. Within that sheet, there are two layers, one in which the fibers run longitudinally along this way, and another one in which the fibers run transversely or in a circular motion. And those two layers actually make up the entire sheet of smooth muscle. Sometimes, in certain cases, there's a third oblique layer. So things like the stomach, for example, is lined with, so I'm gonna say the stomach has a third oblique layer. That just means the stomach has an extra layer of smooth muscle in its wall that the fibers run in a diagonal direction like this. The reason for the, the variation in fiber direction is so things can be squeezed. <clears throat> it gives different actions when those sheets of muscles are contracted. <clears throat> so the contractions of smooth muscle produce actions that are called Peristalsis, that's supposed to be an S. P-E-R-I-S-T-A-L-S-I-S. -S. <clears throat> that's in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, digestive system. And that's, that's so a squeezing motion. So if we eat food and it enters our GI tract, the squeezing action of these smooth muscles in the lining of the wall pushes that food along this GI tract. The movement of substance from one location to another via smooth muscle contractions is referred to as peristalsis. <clears throat> It'll, they also produce, smooth muscle contractions produce constriction. And that's specifically in our vessels. So the smooth muscle that lines our vessel walls, I'm gonna give you a cross section here. 
there's a blood vessel. When these muscles in this wall, smooth muscles contract, it makes the diameter of that vessel get smaller. And when those muscles relax, the diameter of that vessel, it's called dilation, it gets larger. That's a constriction activity. <clears throat> I'm still talking about smooth muscle. The nervous innervation of smooth muscle is by the autonomic nervous system. Unless you've had AMP before, that may or may not mean a lot to you right now. This is the part of the arm or the division of the nervous system that we do not have conscious control over. That's in contrast to skeletal muscle is innervated by the motor nervous system which is also called somatic. This we do have conscious control over skeletal muscle, but the autonomic, no conscious control, just happens I tell students automatically, which sounds like autonomic. <clears throat> so you know that in skeletal muscle, I've drawn this several times, each individual fiber must be innervated by its own motor end unit of a nerve cell in order to contract. So these cells within a skeletal muscle are sort of electrically isolated from each other. That means when this one, this fiber that I've, I'm drawing right now, gets stimulated to contract, this fiber right here, that has no bearing on these other fibers within that muscle. Not so with a smooth muscle. Smooth autonomic innervation of the smooth muscles are arranged in bulbous swellings called varicosities. So varicosities are, are innervation by the autonomic nervous system of smooth muscles. And those work something like this. Varicosities are these bulbous swellings of the autonomic nervous system that release neurotransmitter, their chemical, onto a wide diffu diffuse area of a muscle sheet. So I'm gonna draw now a smooth muscle sheet. It's a, it's a thin sheet of these muscle cells like this. It's a flat sheet. And these bulbous swellings from the autonomic nervous system, they release their chemical over a wide area of cells, not specifically lined up to individual cells like skeletal muscle. And then that, that chemical just sort of bathes some of these cells. And what's most important is the cells in smooth muscle can transmit electrical impulses from cell to cell. They are not electrically isolated like skeletal muscle. What that tells us is if I release neurotransmitter, say onto these, I'm gonna use a different color, onto this yellow cell, this yellow cell into this area of this sheet of smooth muscle. <clears throat> because these cells, I'm gonna put by gap junctions, are connected by gap junctions, they can transmit electrically, electrical impulses from cell to cell, therefore transmitting the electrical impulse all throughout this sheet of muscle, even though the original area of stimulation was only right here. That's very different than skeletal muscles, which are electrically isolated. <clears throat> Some more differences, smooth muscle,
<clears throat> smooth muscle cells have calcium channels on their plasma membranes, calcium channels on their sarcolemma that open upon neural stimulation. So remember back in a skeletal muscle, when we stimulate that muscle, all of the intracellular calcium comes from the storage sites of the sarcoplasmic reticulum within that cell. In a smooth muscle, when it is stimulated, calcium channels on the membrane open and calcium from outside of the cell enters the cell. And we, we call that extracellular calcium. enters. That's a big difference. So these muscle cells use extracellular calcium to perform a contraction, whereas skeletal muscle cells use stored intracellular calcium to perform their contractions. <clears throat> now I need to put a, a highlight on this. Smooth muscle cells do have the ability to store some calcium, but it's a very small amount. Most of what they use for contraction is from an extracellular source. <clears throat> Smooth muscle cells have no sarcomeres. Those are those functional contractile units. Like skeletal muscle cells have. Skeletal muscles have sarcomeres. Smooth muscle cells do not. Their myofilaments, they do have thick filaments, myosin, and thin, thin filaments, actin. They're different, and they're different, different, differently arranged. So I'm just going to put, they do have, sorry about the stuttering. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. They do have myosin and actin, but they are arranged differently. In a skeletal muscle cell, <clears throat> remember we had those thick filaments and then those thin filaments and they were very regularly arranged like this. That's skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle cells don't have this sarcomere type of arrangement. Their myosin heads are shorter and they're arranged not in a very specific arrangement and their actin filaments sort of do this. So that it's sort of this <clears throat> um, haphazard looking type of arrangement. And when the muscles contract, when the myosin heads do pull the actin molecules, they do so in sort of this spiral diagonal squeezing motion, that's, that's beneficial to our digestive organs in particular, because if you picture when a, when a smooth muscle, sheet of smooth muscle contracts, picture wringing out a wet towel. It sort of twists and contract, and you're contracting those fibers to wring the water out of it. it um, our digestive organs sort of behave in that arrangement, not like a skeletal muscle that contracts directionally, almost unidirectionally like this a smooth muscle sheet contraction sort of is like a squeezing action. So that's a main difference as well. No sarcomeres, they do have actin and myosin, which is a similarity, but they behave quite differently. Um, almost finished. In smooth muscle, uh, let me get my black pen back. In smooth muscle, there are not only no sarcomere arrangement, but there's no troponin tropomyosin complex. So calcium binds to a protein within the smooth muscle cell called <clears throat> cal 
modulin, not troponin, like in a skeletal muscle cell. Cal calmodulin is a protein that is that sits inside of a smooth muscle cell and it's inactive until calcium binds to it. When calcium binds to calmodulin in a smooth muscle, it activates calmodulin. So I'm just going to put once activated. <clears throat> activated. Uh, calmodulin, calmodulin then activates kinases, myosin kinases, which are enzymes that then phosphorylate the myosin heads. Sorry, let me spell that correctly. So just to reiterate, we're comparing and contrasting here now with skeletal muscle. Just to remind you in a skeletal muscle, intra, intracellular calcium is released within the cell. That binds to troponin. This is skeletal muscle. I'm almost finished for the day. Calcium binds to troponin, that lifts tropomyosin off of the active sites of actin. So this gets lifted off of actin, exposing the sites, exposing binding sites. ATP then phosphorylates the myosin head and myosin binds actin and pulls it toward the M line, the power stroke. That's in contrast to this set of events. Extracellular calcium from outside of the cell enters the cell upon neural stimulation. Calcium binds to a protein called calmodulin, not troponin. Calmodulin then activates enzymes called myosin kinases that phosphorylate the myosin heads in smooth muscle. ATP actually never attaches to the myosin heads in smooth muscle. In this case, if this is our smooth muscle myosin molecule, it's shorter, wider, and it's not, it's, it looks different, but it still has a bit of a stem and a, and a bulbous head. If this is a myosin head and smooth muscle, once these myosin kinases get activated, what they do is an ATP molecule out here, not attached to the myosin head, gets split. That terminal phosphate gets split off of ATP and attack, the individual phosphate gets attached to the myosin head and that energizes myosin to then attach to actin and pull it. So it's a different set series of events. All right, last statement of the day, I promise, is this. In skeletal muscle, <clears throat> it must be neurally stimulated <clears throat> to contract each individual cell. Smooth muscle can be neurally stimulated, but each individual cell does not have to be stimulated. I'm gonna say, can be transmitted from cell to cell through those gap junctions, and this is a big and, smooth muscle cell can be hormonally stimulated. So hormones, 
not the nervous system, have the ability to cause smooth muscle to contract. Not so up here. Skeletal muscle must be stimulated by the somatic motor nervous system in order to contract each individual cell. Smooth muscle can be neurally stimulated by the autonomic nervous system, but that electricity can be transmitted from cell to cell. Also, hormones can stimulate smooth muscle cells to contract. So those are some, some similarities and differences. All right, guys, I am finished for today. It's Friday. Um, it's kind of dreary out there. If you have any questions for me, feel free to unmute your microphone um, now and ask me any questions you'd like. Uh, the, the specific sections that this uh, quiz is going to cover, your next quiz is going to cover, are listed on the outline um, for module three. Same business, that quiz will open up at noon I think on Monday and be open until 11.59 p.m. It's basically going to cover that, I think it's chapter nine, um, in the textbook, all the way from the beginning of, of muscle tissue and skeletal muscle, all the way through the smooth muscle section that I, that I went over. Is everybody okay? I'm just going to cut off my recording, but I'm going to stay here.